everyone for coming. Um, I'm Jody Zimmer. I've been a respiratory therapist for 24 years almost. Um, done a wide range of things, but currently I'm the supervisor of the Home Oxygen Program Island Wide for Vancouver Island, supervisor of pulmonary function and the Respiratory Education Centre in the South Island. I do have a presentation here to share. Um, and I think I'll just tackle that first and then we'll open it up to any questions. Um, we'll see if I can successfully share my screen. Yeah, and you should be able to. I gave you, I gave you the power, so I do see your screen. I can see it. It's uh, if you want to put it into full presentation mode. Yeah, let's the, see. The slideshow. I should know how to do that. That's okay. <laughs> go, to, go to slideshow, Jody. It's just in underneath that orange bar at the top. Keep going. Oh yes. And then click that and play from start. You should get an option. It's not letting me click it. That's okay. Then um, at the next row below that, if you go down and then to the left, it says from beginning, give that a click. There we go. Got it. And that should show up in just a second. Is it, did it show up on yours? It's black on mine. Okay. Maybe hit escape. Oh, it went right to black. Well, that's odd. I've never seen it go straight to black before. When I heard him, he said, I'm a good ass spirit. Do not bother your mom. And um, I'm going to stop so sharing for a second. Sure. Yeah. We'll be back in two minutes. You just put in how you had it yeah, before. Yeah. That's okay. Fine. I could hear and then I was in the room, so I saw all. Sorry, I've now closed it out for myself, so I'm just looking for it. That's okay, you know what? Got it. Let me know if you can pull it up. So I'm going to share my screen again, and then I'll pull it up. Sure. Yeah. yeah I can do screen, no problem. Oh, just one sec. Don't we love technology? Uh, no. I'm usually not the driver. I'm so sorry. That's it's okay. okay. We experience this lots with lots of our presentations. Yes. We can. Alexa, you sent it to me, right? the uh, presentation yes I, no i don't know if i have hers if she's added anything to hers oh, she hasn't added anything sorry everybody give us just one quick second yeah you should have it. i sent it to both of you okay do you see my screen we do you know what i think that'll be fine jody just to go from there if that's easier why don't you try the bottom like so for me when i use it the very bottom right that's where i used to um Hello. Yeah, that oh. thing. No, nope, it, it just goes black for me. Okay. Just have it as, however you had it before then. Okay. There go. That'll be fine. Yep. Yeah. All right. It is what it is. It is what it is. Okay. So what is oxygen therapy? Well, it is a drug. It is oxygen. We have oxygen in the air, but sometimes we need um, a more concentrated amount and more that, than what's in what's available in the air. So we use oxygen therapy for conditions um, to treat hypoxia. So hypoxia is low um, oxygen levels. We use it as a flow rate. So whether it's out of a tank or a concentrator um, or a wall, a wall outlet in hospital, um, we use it as a flow rate, whether it's one, two, three, four or higher. Humidifier bottles can be used and they can prevent drying, um, but generally, depending on the amount of oxygen you might be on, it's not often necessary. So our body has the ability to humidify up to four, up to and including four liters of oxygen um, or any liter flow 
Um, so it shouldn't really be needed under that. Aside from that, sometimes the humidifier bottles don't actually fit on a concentrator. And as well, in my experience, those humidifier bottles can provide some resistance. So while you may be getting some humidity, you may not be getting the actual leader flow that's set. I run into that a few times at, at higher flow rates. And it won't let me advance. Oh, I'm not winning. I wonder, Lindsay, if it's because of the document that it's in. Would you mind sharing it for me, Lindsay, and then I'll just speak to it? Uh, Lindsay. Just one sec, I will uh, call Lindsay get her to share the screen. I'm wondering if it's just because it's the link that it's on. Could be. Jody, can you Jody, can you, Jody, can you, Jody, you got me, Jody? Yep. Got me, Jody. Got me, Jody. I think that was a lamb. Jody, can you hear? Jody, can you hear? Jody, can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay, should I go ahead? Lindsay and Alexa, just let me know if I can go ahead. If I speak, does it echo? Okay, or Jody, for some reason, Lindsay's um, screen, when she's sharing it, she's echoing. So go ahead, go ahead. and um, she can hear you. So when you want the next one, just say when you want next. Okay, thank you. All right, so oxygen therapy is a treatment that provides extra oxygen to patients who... Um, don't have enough. 
So there's different diseases, different conditions that can cause a person not to have enough oxygen. Um, because of this, oxygen, oxygen therapy can be important in, um, in assisting to achieve normal oxygen levels. Next, please. Simply feeling short of breath doesn't mean that someone needs oxygen. Um, there's many reasons people can feel short of breath with the various lung conditions, and I can go into that uh, in more detail later. Um, your doctor will likely require a blood test or at least an oxygen assessment uh, to determine what your oxygen levels are. Once a doctor can definitely say that your oxygen levels are low, then he or she can recommend oxygen therapy. Um, whether it's short-term, long-term, that depends on what is going on for you. Uh, whether it's a change in something that's going to improve or if it's kind of the long-term traje trajectory that you are now going to be using oxygen. Next, please. If you aren't receiving enough oxygen, you could experience shortness of breath. Um, you could experience um, an increased heart rate, wheezing, sweating, and fatigue. These symptoms can be a problem for your, your activities of daily living, of course, because it makes those doing those activities more difficult and it's exhausting for you. Next slide, please. The oxygen is administered through um, oxygen tubing, either via a mask or nasal prongs. Um, people with chronic breathing problems may also may have a portable oxygen tank so that they can have access to oxygen while they're moving about, whether they're um, you know, going out for groceries, appointments. Um, there are some people that need oxygen while they're moving out and about, and other people only need it at night. So just because your friend has um, oxygen when they go out for groceries and appointments, it doesn't mean that uh, you would need oxygen at that time. There's a few different oxygen therapies that can be prescribed based on the patient's results from um, obtaining the data. Um, you could use oxygen via a gas form, liquid oxygen, um, or via oxygen concentrators. There's also hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which we're not really talking about today, but it does exist out there. Next slide, please. Um, oxygen therapy and hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, can provide benefit to those who are being treated. Um, if administered regularly and when the doctor deems necessary, it can um, assist you with your breathing improve your exercise tolerance, improve your sex life, and facilitate a safer air travel. Um, additionally, oxygen therapy can reduce the complications associated with COPD, including pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, um, and work to relieve some shortness of breath, fatigue, and dizziness. Um, what's also important to know, and again, we can talk about later, is how very important exercise is in managing your lung condition. And so if oxygen can be used to support you in exercising, that's a huge, huge benefit. Next, please. So the goals of using oxygen um, are to reduce your symptoms of dyspnea if lack of oxygen is the issue, um, to improve exercise tolerance and your ability to do your activities of daily living, and to improve comorbidities. So when we talk about the use of oxygen, there's studies out there that state if you don't use oxygen for at least 15 hours of day uh, during the day, there is not much benefit to reducing your mortality. What I mean by that is not, oh, we should all wear an extra one liter a day for 24 hours because that's going to help us. It's not. But if you know that you, if you've been told that you need oxygen, but you're only using it 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, after you've gone for your walk around the block and you come home, recover, and you use your oxygen for 10 minutes, it's not going to do a darn thing for you. So it's important when um, getting the benefits from using oxygen that you're using it as prescribed. 
um, oxygen can reduce your risk of uh, disease progression, um, prevent and treat exacerbations, and reduce mortality. Like I said, it depends how long you use it in a day and if you're using it properly. Next slide. So the management of COPD, first of all, you need to be diagnosed. And there's often times where you may have a CT scan, an X-ray. Your doctors will see, you know, kind of the classic signs of COPD and say, okay, yep, you have COPD. But it is really important to have a spirometry. That is the, the gold standard for diagnosis of COPD. The other thing a breathing test spirometry can do is provide a grading for your COPD. So you are you listed as mild, moderate, severe, or very severe? Where that can come in handy is for medication purposes. There's forms that the doctors can fill out at times to provide you access to certain medications if your um, lung condition is severe enough. So it comes, uh, it's important for pharmacotherapy, which is drugs. Um, Let's see. So for initial management of COPD, and I'm looking at the, the one of the bottom boxes there, if you are smoking, it is really important in managing your lung condition um, and for treatment to stop smoking. Easier said than done, of course. And again, I can answer some questions about that later too. Uh, getting your vaccination. So uh, the pneumovax, for example, vaccine, if you can prevent getting a pneumonia, you're going to be all the more better for it. Um, maintaining an active lifestyle and exercising. Again, people look at me with two heads when I say you need to exercise because they'll say I can't even breathe normally or I'm short of breath when I go get a glass of water. How the heck do I exercise? So good question. And I have some answers for you there. Um, Taking your medication properly, that's really important. There's a variety of puffers and a few different devices. They're used differently. Some people are able to use certain ones easier than others. And your pharmacist, your doctor, you know, a, a friendly neighborhood respiratory therapist can review that to make sure you're getting the most of it as possible. Also self-management. Um, so looking at your risk factors. So one of the questions I saw was, you know, about forest fires. So when you're in the, the depths of forest fires, that might not be the days that you go for a picnic in the park. So really managing, you know, if you look after your grandchildren and they're full of snotty noses right now, it might not be the best day for you to look after your grandchildren um, to be able to prevent yourself from getting sick. I've already mentioned the inhaler technique, um, breathlessness, there's certain techniques. I don't know if you've heard of purslip breathing, but I would be happy to share in a few minutes. It is so, so important. Um, and action plans, as well as managing your other conditions, because we all know, um, you know, it's not that common for people to have one issue and one issue only. There's often um, people are dealing with more than just their lung condition, whether it's heart disease, uh, old cancer, new cancer, high cholesterol, things like that. So we look at, um, just to review, we look at your symptoms, um, taking a look at exacerbations. You know, some people just don't have exacerbations. Some people have lots. The surefire way to know if someone is going to have another exacerbation, and again, not guaranteed, but is looking at their history. If you've had one exacerbation already, chances are you're, you're more at risk of having another. Uh, you want to take into account your exposures to other risk factors. And again, this is repetitive, but repetitive, but it's not an issue that it's repetitive. Just knowing that you're taking your inhalers properly and when you're supposed to take them. So for someone who's on um, an inhaled steroid, it is not helpful at all to take it once a week whenever you feel like it. Um, it's meant to be taken on a regular basis. Physical activity is very important and exercise. Pulmonary rehab, when we look at the um, Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines, pulmonary rehab is exercise and education. So the goal is with lung conditions is to be able to manage your own lung condition 
initially with some help and guidance, but then to kind of take over and say, I know what I need to do. I know what I shouldn't be doing. I know what can help so that I can manage and be alerted if there's something changing and if there's a problem and I need to ask for help. So again, some people need oxygen. We can talk about the criteria. Um, palliative is an interesting word nowadays. Like I said, I've been a respiratory therapist for 24 years. Um, it used to be that palliative meant, okay, you know, people's life is expected to end, you know, maybe in six months. Palliative now often means, um, you know, there isn't anything we can do to fix the issue, but how can we manage it and what treatment, supportive treatment is there? to provide to the patient. So someone could have a palliative condition and live for 10, 15 years. So palliative is now, you know, a little bit different. Vaccinations I've already said are really important and also managing your other conditions. Like I said, spirometry. Um, I actually wouldn't agree with at least annually for spirometry. If there's a reason to redo it, if you find you're more short of breath than normal, you're not managing as well, something has changed, you've had five exacerbations in a year, sure, it's a good idea to see the trend. Or if there's maybe a um, medication concern, your doctor may order it. But if you're doing well, managing well, there really isn't any reason to, to do it annually. Next slide, please. And this is what I was referring to is the, the gold criteria and the CTS. You're welcome to look it up at any time, but this is what we use as our guidelines for treatment. Next slide. How do we know who needs oxygen? So the current criteria, and this is provincial for BC, I can't, it would be similar for other provinces in Canada, but it likely is not exactly the same. To be honest, I saw a spreadsheet recently of the different provinces and there was um, minor differences, but it's the same idea. I can only speak for BC. And then in, more specifically, I can speak for um, Island Health. So the current criteria is the partial pressure of oxygen in our blood, which is taken from an artery in our wrist. It's called an arterial blood gas. If it is less than or equal to 55 when you are otherwise not wearing extra oxygen, you will be funded by the home oxygen program and you will need oxygen 24 hours a day. If your oxygen is less than or equal to 60, um, and you have pulmonary hypertension and or, and or congestive heart failure, 60 is the magic number. Uh, if someone needs nocturnal oxygen, and this could be because they have COPD, it could be because they have sleep apnea, there's lots of reasons, could be that they have heart failure. Um, if your oxygen levels are less than 88% for greater than 30% of the night, you will likely qualify to have oxygen paid for and you will use it at night. Now it says um, OSA needs to be ruled out, that's obstructive sleep apnea or maximally, maximally treated. Certainly for us, it does say as part of our criteria that oxygen will only be approved if all other treatments were you know, attempted. But we know that there are people that are claustrophobic and will never wear a mask for um, with a CPAP machine. We also know that there's people that will start CPAP and maybe their um, the settings aren't quite fine tuned and there's more testing that needs to happen. So sometimes people still need oxygen while starting out with treatment with a CPAP machine. Some people will always need oxygen. It's just going to be part of their care while they use a CPAP machine. So I will approve nocturnal oxygen right away um, because it's always short term right away. And then we go in and assess and follow up and say, oh, you know, you're using your CPAP. You're obviously you're you have a good prescription. You no longer need the oxygen or maybe you do. And we would leave it. Next slide, please. Ambulatory oxygen. So again, the criteria is 
It states in the criteria, and it was made up years ago before I was in this position, but basically it says if you only need ambulatory oxygen, but at rest your oxygen levels are higher than 88, then you're not going to be approved for ambulatory oxygen. How I look at it when I'm approving is do your oxygen levels while you're walking go down to 87%, which is of course just qualifying. And then they improve as soon as you sit down and your activity level is going to the kitchen to get a glass of water, not really going out, not planning to exercise. There really isn't going to be any benefit. So that was the scenario of, you know, there's benefit if you use oxygen for 15 hours a day or more, if you need it, of course. Um, but if someone's oxygen levels drop, you know, to 85%, 80%, that's significant and that's putting a strain on your heart. So in those cases, I will absolutely um, provide oxygen just for ambulation. If someone needs oxygen while they're at rest, they automatically will get it for ambulation. So again, it's best if your oxygen is worn for greater than 15 days. Having said that, or sorry, 15 hours a day, having said that, if you have oxygen for ambulation, I don't need you to look at a clock and say, I need to wear it another hour. I've only worn it for 14 hours. Um, if you're prescribed 24 hour a day oxygen, you should be at least wearing it 15 hours a day or it's not going to provide much benefit to you. Um, if you're prescribed to use it while you're walking, that's when you use it. And I wouldn't focus on the 15 hours. Because if you only have oxygen while you're walking around, we've discovered by assessing you that you don't need it while you're sitting, okay? So the goal when we're providing oxygen to you is to have your oxygen levels around 90%. They do not need to be 98%. Um, we do wanna see them 88 to 90. Anything below 88% is putting a strain on your cells and your muscles and your heart. Um, there, it decreases morbidity and mortality in patients who have moderate to severe hypoxemia at rest. That's low oxygen levels in your blood. Um, what improvement in symptoms may be seen? I, I hear a baby. So um, the improvement in your symptoms may be um, less shortness of breath, although it you know, there's no guarantee that it will take away all shortness of breath. And I can talk about that in a second. Um, but you may find that you have more energy because you don't have to recover as much. Let's say you're up walking around and your oxygen levels go down to 80%. You go up a level of stairs and you have to stop at the end and recover. If you're using oxygen and your oxygen levels stay 88%, by the time you get to the top of the stairs, you're probably not going to be a shorter breath. You probably won't need to stop and recover. And anyone with lung conditions and shortness of breath, you know what I mean when I say, and I don't fully understand, of course, but when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And it takes an incredible amount of energy. When our breathing is normal and fine, we don't think about our breathing. We just breathe. But when you have trouble with your breathing, you think about it all the time. And it does take a lot of energy. What if you don't qualify? If you don't qualify for oxygen, it means you don't need it at that time. It doesn't mean something might change and you may need it in the future. It could also mean that you've needed oxygen and now you don't. Sometimes people get sick and need oxygen while they're sick and recovering. Sometimes people need oxygen and then they decide, okay, now I'm going to do the pulmonary rehab and start exercising. In those situations, once you start exercising and your body becomes more efficient at the cellular level in using oxygen and get, getting rid of the carbon dioxide, you won't need the oxygen. Your oxygen levels will be improved. Um, so if you don't qualify, it's because you don't need it. It doesn't mean your lung condition is fixed. It, there's still going to be um, ways you can manage your symptoms. So you may very well still feel short of breath, even if you don't need oxygen. But there's breathing techniques we can talk about too. Next slide. 
So these are pictures of the oxygen devices you could have in your home. Um, there's the compressed oxygen, which is in a tank, and that is used for portability. You could either have like a shoulder strap, it can be in a, um, a carrier, or it could be on a uh, cart, as you see at the bottom. The oxygen concentrator in the middle at the top is meant to be at someone's bedside or in your living room because it does not have a battery, it gets plugged into the wall. Liquid oxygen is liquid oxygen. Um, now, to be honest, we actually can't get that any longer on the island because it's too dangerous to transport and it's really expensive. On the mainland, I believe people still have access to liquid oxygen. I did have a meeting with one of the vendors in the last couple months here because there are people that use quite a high flow rate of oxygen. And I, even with my, my history and my career, I assumed that liquid oxygen would provide oxygen for a longer period of time compared to a, a regular oxygen tank. That's not actually the case. I think if someone at a set liter flow, if someone needs oxygen, the liquid oxygen would provide maybe 30 minutes longer. So if we're talking four hours with the tanks, you may get four and a half hours with the liquid oxygen. There's also concerns about, you know, the oxygen dissipating for the liquid oxygen and things like that. So just to say that we don't have access to that here on the island anymore. There is a portable oxygen concentrator, which is in, in the middle at the bottom. Now that would be battery operated. It also has its limitations. So if you're someone that can't trigger a portable oxygen concentrator that gives you a pulse of oxygen when it senses you've taken a breath in, you may need continuous flow. Most portable oxygen concentrators can only provide two liters at a continuous flow. There's also people that have prescriptions, they might need eight liters of oxygen while they're walking. That portable oxygen concentrator won't meet your needs. You would have to use a tank with a flow rate that can be set at eight. So just because you see your friend uh, down the street with a little oxygen concentrator that looks so easy to carry, it doesn't mean that it will meet your needs. And when we come and assess you and say, okay, yes, you need oxygen, uh, we also look at what's going to meet your needs as well. All right, next slide. Non-invasive ventilation, I'm not gonna focus too much on that. I can say that sometimes for end-stage COPD, it is helpful. Um, and oftentimes we have to add oxygen to the circuit when someone is using CPAP or BiPAP. Um, but other than that, I won't, I won't speak to that. Next slide. All right, we're ready for questions. All right, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Jody, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, wonderful. Finally, we got all the issues. Technical issues. Technical issues done. So I'll, I'll just speak to that non-invasive ventilation, that CPAP or BiPAP side of things. Sometimes when people have COPD, and so that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, um, that's inside your airways, sometimes they can have an overlapping syndrome called obstructive sleep apnea, where outside of the lungs, our upper airways can get floppy and close off. And sometimes um, effectively treating that may improve your pulmonary function, or at least help recruit your lungs. So then um, it's kind of an overlap syndrome. So we just threw that in there just to, to highlight that if you have been diagnosed with an obstructive sleep apnea, that it's, um, it's good to look into seeing if you can treat it and get it managed because it may improve how you are. And if you require oxygen day and night, you can add oxygen to that as well. Um, so Jody, I know you received four questions in advance. Do you want to address those first? Sure, I can read them out and then answer them. Yeah, wonderful. So these were, I believe, sent through the Better Breathers Facebook page. So they have been, um, they were given a little bit sooner. Okay. Okay. So the first question is, I'm on liquid oxygen for portable oxygen and exertion. I need to travel by vehicle to another province. What source of oxygen is my best bet? How do I go about arranging this? 
So what you're going to what you're going to have to think about with travel. I'm not sure what province this person is from and which one they're going to, but I know for British Columbia, the home oxygen program does not pay for travel. So if you, for example, um, I'm going to go off on a tangent and then I'll come back to the question. If you have a portable oxygen concentrator and that is going to meet your needs while you travel, because it, it should, um, as long as you're able to plug it in and charge it, say overnight, you can use it during the day while you're driving and traveling. Then you don't need anything different. If, for example, um, you use oxygen at night and you have that stationary concentrator plugged in beside your bed, unless you throw that in your car and take it with you, um, you may need something set up where you're going. So if you needed, say, a second concentrator at your bedside, wherever you're traveling to, the home oxygen program would not fund that. You're welcome to talk to your vendor and figure out what the cost is and pay for that. So in the situation of liquid oxygen, you would wanna think about how long am I away? When do I get my deliveries? And is that may or may not be able to happen wherever you're going. Um, so you'd have to talk to your vendor that provides it. Um, there is likely, very likely, another piece of equipment that can meet your needs. Okay, so again, you would have to talk to your vendor about, about travel, whether it's an option to take your liquid oxygen or if you'd have to switch to something else. And what they would do is, what they should do is leave you with something, whether it's a portable oxygen concentrator that is not liquid um, and let you trial it for a few days to make sure it's gonna meet your needs. And if you're already being funded by a home oxygen program for the liquid oxygen, it could be that you'd have to pay for that different portable oxygen. Jody, can I add into that question? Just because mm -hmm. it's a question that I always wonder about and never seem to get a consistent answer is, what if you're traveling by air? Does that limit you on the devices you can take on an airplane? Yeah, one of the questions is, um, is flying without supplemental oxygen dangerous? Okay. Um, someone flew to Florida without using their portable oxygen concentrator and did not feel anything unusual. So what I know is that if you have to travel with oxygen, at least this was the case years ago, I had someone on one of our wards that was going flying from BC to Texas and Texas was their home. So I believe they were going to be given a portable oxygen concentrator or it could have even been a tank, I can't recall. But with the airline, they needed to fill out paperwork and get approval or permission. So there's, a, there's certain equipment that they allow on their aircraft and it's, it would be that they've looked into it, the liability, whatever it might be, but there's a certain list that is approved to be on their aircraft. So you'd have to go through those hoops. The partial pressure of oxygen is less up higher. So one of the respirologists said to me, you know, if we know someone is in emergency and their oxygen levels are low and they're flying home, let's say, they said to me, as long as their oxygen levels while walking are greater than 88, they are fine to travel. So again, it would be speak to your doctor. They can advise whether they want you to be assessed and they may have a number in mind that they think is safe. So whether it's 92%, 94% at rest. So that could be why this person that used a portable oxygen concentrator didn't feel anything unusual. Maybe at rest, their oxygen levels were more than adequate. Does that answer your question, Lindsay? Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you. Shall I go to my next question? Yeah, I think that'd be yeah. wonderful. What is the minimum healthy oxygen saturation level percentage? So our bodies should be seeing 88% oxygen or higher. Um, anything lower than that for a sustained period of time is a strain on our cells, our muscles, our heart, our lungs, and our brain. And it leads to you know, the symptoms we've already discussed. When we provide someone with oxygen, our goal is 90%. You know, when we talk about, if I give you an oxygen prescription of two liters and you say, well, 
I want to use five because it makes me feel better. Even though I've said to you at two liters, your oxygen levels are 90, 91%. There are things that aren't as advantageous if you go higher. First of all, there's gonna be no benefit to you. There's no benefit to having oxygen levels of 95% compared to 90 because your cells and your muscles and your heart and your brain are okay at 90. Then you're gonna get the drawing out of your mucosa in your nose. You're gonna be using your oxygen faster. And if you use it to go out and about, just because you think the number of five is better and you wanna see a higher number, you're gonna go through it faster. So there's advantages to kind of sticking to as low as you can be safely. Um, let's see. The last question is, I'm not sure what state we have to be in in order to have an oxygen tank at home. I've been on prednisone just about every week for the past two years and nobody can tell me why all the flare ups. I was wondering if we have, if we have more forest fires in the Kamloops area, how do I manage the air besides staying at home? That's absolutely a challenge when you live somewhere where the air quality um, is poor or at least poor during certain times. And it is recommended generally that if you have a trigger and you know it's a trigger, which for most people, even myself, I would find forest fires very um, challenging to live around. Um, that you should be avoiding those situations. Easier said than done. If you still have to go to the grocery store, if you, you know, and you want to get out and about, you don't want to stay at home. And it depends how long that the, the trigger is going on. So again, it's, it's a balance of, can you get your groceries delivered for a week or two while you have forest fires going on? So what can you do differently to limit your exposure within reason, because I understand that you can't always avoid everything. Um, how bad do you have to be in order to have oxygen at home? Again, when we talk about the grading of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, someone can have minimal disease and be short of breath brushing their teeth. Someone can have very severe disease, like 20% lung function, and go for a one mile walk every day. So because you may have every symptom under the sun and you may feel awful, again, it doesn't mean that you need oxygen. So I've seen people with 80% lung function need oxygen. And I've seen people with 20% oxygen not need oxygen. There's other things going on in your lungs that make you feel symptomatic and short of breath. Um, so for the person saying, you know, what do I have to do to have a tank in my home? If you've been assessed and your oxygen levels are okay, look at what other management things you can be doing. So purse lip breathing. Um, how do you get into an exercise program that can support you while very slowly increasing your activity level um, to do it safely? Okay, so and... Um, if you feel awful, maybe something's changed. Maybe you need to see your doctor. Chances are the person who has regular flare-ups is in very close contact with their physician, which is good. Um, and then there's an action plan. So if you know that something's changing, you may already have an emergency kit at home, which is antibiotics and prednisone that you can start taking. And that's one of those management things that if you are going to have an exacerbation, you can't always prevent it but you can start treating it as soon as you know that it's going to happen. Sometimes it takes a day or two to recognize, um, but treating it earlier than later is going to be better, okay? The other thing I'll tell you is, even if you don't qualify for the home oxygen program, you can have oxygen at home. You do need a doctor's prescription, um, but again, if you don't need it, it's probably not going to provide much benefit. And Jody, right. if somebody purchases oxygen privately, do you have an estimation of perhaps what the monthly cost to them might be? I don't offhand because okay. what we pay from a billing perspective is different. It's all within a contract. Um, no, I don't okay. know. 
I've heard numbers like 400 a month, 500 a month renting or, or purchasing. I, I believe a concentrator on its own, a standalone can be upwards of around $4,000 perhaps. So it, it's not a cheap thing to add in if you, if you don't require it, I think. Exactly. And some people have extended health benefits. So I want to be clear because this comes up all the time. If you have extended health and they, your extended health includes paying for oxygen, the funding for your oxygen comes from your extended health first. And that's not my decision. That's a ministry decision. Um, if you have Blue Cross and it pays 80% of your oxygen bill, then the home, our home oxygen program will fund the other 20%. If you have Blue Cross and you have a maximum amount and it includes your other medications and you're maxed out on your yearly or forever amount, then we will take over 100% billing. So if you meet criteria and allow reassessments in your home, we will continue funding as long as you need it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I have two more questions that were sent in. Um, question one gets asked quite frequently um, is how to manage when someone has home oxygen, um, the dryness of the nose. So um, is there any tips, tricks, um, any type of solutions or um, ointments that they can use to help with the drying out of the nose? You can use ointments. You don't want to use petroleum jelly because that is a concern with oxygen. Um, to be honest, I don't have names of lubricants off the you know, top of my head to list for you, um, but I'm sure you could Google you know, lubricants safe around oxygen use. Um, the other thing is knowing your prescription. So do you need six liters while you're up walking around and two liters at rest? Make sure you're tweaking it down. You know, there is benefit to turning it up a few minutes prior to walking around, but some people, some people honestly can't change their setting easily. And I understand that, but if you can make sure you're turning it down when you can. The other thing is make sure you're drinking enough water. And again, that's as long as you don't have limitations of fluid intake. I understand everyone has lots of things going on, um, but the best source of hydration is um, systemic hydration, which is drinking liquid. Okay. Same thing goes for if you have a lot of mucus in your chest. You can think about humidity and a humidifier and all those different things, but the best source of humidity is systemic, meaning drinking water. And Jody, when you mentioned that petroleum-based lubricants are to be avoided, should we be looking for a water-based lubricant? That yeah, I would say so. So you're not going to want to use Vaseline. Okay. I love Vaseline for many uses, but you don't want to put it on your nose. Yes. <laughs> okay. There's okay. also, for someone that's on a higher flow rate of oxygen, we do have what's called oxy masks. They're a mask that goes over your nose and your mouth, and they have big holes on the side, which is really important. You don't want to be using a face mask if you're on one or two liters of oxygen because you're not breathing enough to have the carbon dioxide that you're exhaling to get out of the way. You don't want to rebreathe that. And people with lung disease may have a harder time doing that to get rid of that CO2, okay? Alexa, you've got one more question, I believe. Yeah, one more question that was um, sent in was, um, the person that sent this in said that they're on oxygen 24-7 uh, and she's been wanting to do cooking but told that because she has a gas stove, um, she can't be around it with her gas stove. But do you have any solutions for her or tips? Mm -hmm. Good question. I don't offhand. That could be a good question for your vendor um, because they may be advising their patients what to do in the home. So I, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't. That's a tricky one. I mean, you don't wanna take oxygen near an open flame because that's a good source of fire, <laughs> but. Um, I mean, it was advised to change her stove out, but then it comes to a cost for that right. too. I mean, it depends on the 
prescription, so you've said 24 hour oxygen, um, could it be that he or she uses one or two liters at rest, but more while they're walking, maybe they could pull up a stool and sit by the stove and not have their oxygen on. Maybe that person is able to go an hour without having their oxygen and they feel okay for the short time frame. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, relate, like kind of to reach out to her local RT or home OT just to kind of see if there's, she could take breaks for when she cooks. Mm -hmm. Um, Alexa, was that it for the questions you had from the web page? You betcha. So just a couple more questions just to round out the, the presentation, Jody, you've been wonderful. Um, there is a question from one patient that says, what are some exercises or what is some exercises to do if you have pulmonary fibrosis and COPD? I'm just going to fire off really quickly. Um, in this series of presentations, we had the physiotherapist come in, talk about bronchial hygiene. So that is available in the recorded um, episodes, I will say. But Jody, I'd love to hear what you would recommend as well. So really, I would recommend looking at the resources available. So looking at Living Well with COPD as a website. Um, has some really good um, educational information. In regards to exercise, just generally, it's important to focus on strength training as well as cardio. So to be quite honest, if you're someone that doesn't do much or doesn't know where to start, um, because it can be very scary, while you're watching TV, get some soup cans, and do this. You know, it's amazing how simple it can be with a little bit of weight with things we have in our home. Whether you go to Walmart and buy the five pound dumbbells, or if you have a little, you know, chocolate milk container that's empty and just filled with a bit of water, um, just to start somewhere. Um, so stretching exercises are important. Strength exercise, you probably wouldn't choose to do all of them in the same day. Um, when we talk about cardio, it could be as simple as walking. Maybe you have a stationary bike already. But again, when you're sitting in your chair and you get up to get a glass of water and you have to stop because of your short of breath, what do you mean I have to get on my bike for 20 minutes? So again, it's going to be to start slow. You want, the advice is you want to be able to still have a brief conversation with someone next to you. If you're pushing yourself so hard that you can't speak, it's too much. I'm going to go over something that maybe all of you know, but if you don't, it's very important. Something like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you feel like you can't get the air in, but you can't get the air in because you have air trapped that you can't get out. Okay, so... If you've never heard about purslip breathing, when we get off this call, please Google it. Please look at living well with COPD. Purslip breathing is a way to breathe to help splint your airways open to get the air out. So I'll demonstrate it for you briefly. It's a breath in and it's a normal breath in, not an extra big deep breath in. So it's It's like you're going to blow a candle out or you're blowing your hot soup. When I'm breathing without a lung condition, I breathe out twice as long as I breathe in. That's just what our body does. So when you take a breath in, you want to breathe out at least twice as long as you've taken a breath in, if not longer, because you're someone that has air trapped. You've got lots to come out. Okay. Then you think about now I'm going to exercise and I'm going to breathe faster when I exercise that's gonna to lead to more air being trapped. So when you do exercise, it's really important to incorporate that purslip breathing. And if you're working out so hard and you're breathing so fast that you can't do the purslip breathing, you're pushing yourself too hard, okay? You have to start somewhere. And if you're on that bike for a minute the first day, and then a five minute break, and then another minute, five minute break, and another minute, that's three minutes longer than you did yesterday, okay? So you have to know that you are going to start slow and then it will get better and it will get easier. 
Okay. The person that asked about exercise had, um, I think, pulmonary fibrosis. So that is different. It's not air getting trapped. It's scar tissue within your lungs. Um, or an, um, it's a restrictive lung disease, essentially. So you do have trouble getting air in. You can utilize the purslip breathing. Um, some people with pulmonary fibrosis find it beneficial. But exercise is as equally important for someone with pulmonary fibrosis as it is in someone with COPD. And again, it's a matter of monitoring your level of shortness of breath. Because when I exercise, I feel short of breath too. So you are going to feel short of breath when you exercise, but it's a matter of managing it and not pushing yourself to a crisis level. Okay. Um, I think we just have a couple of questions left and then Mihail has put his hand up. So he's got a question. So I see you. Um, just a tip or a trick um, asked by Gina is, has anyone figured out how to work around, you know, the 50 foot cords when you're at home and, you know, you're walking around all the time and they get twisted up. Jody, do you have any, you know, tips or tricks that you've seen over the years that might help with managing the tubing throughout the house? What I would say, I mean, I would guess that there always needs to be an awareness of where it is. What I've seen some people do, and I'm trying to think, if you have the nasal prongs in, can you wear, like you could wear them backwards so that, you know, the, when you cinch up the nasal cannula under your chin, you could have that at the back of your neck so the tubing is coming off the back. You know, you'd still have to watch as you're turning and moving mm -hmm. um, or always having it in your hand so that anything from your, your nose kind of for, let's say, six feet is kind of at your hip. Mm -hmm. So you're hanging on to the slack of it. So but it you... absolutely is a risk. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I agree. I've seen that too. All right, Nihil, do you want to unmute yourself and ask yeah. your question? Jody, yeah, my last question, my friend. Okay, uh, Jody. Yes. I suffer a OCPD, all right? But my saturation is between 96 and 98. Um, if I try, when I go after, I got no problem. My problem is going down. Your problem uh, is going down when you're on the stairs? Yes. Going down, no up. Uh, I am in two liters, okay? Uh, sometimes I can walk, sometimes I can't. That's the reason I carry all the time this. And uh, if I bend, I become in short breath. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do the exercises. I am in Toronto, okay? in the classes in uh how it can improve or what are the recommendation or what happened to me so you, everything believe, is clear in me i believe you told me when you go upstairs your oxygen levels are good and you feel okay yes when you go downstairs are your oxygen levels still okay but you just don't feel as well yeah it cost me more okay i didn't check it out but it, i got the difficulty going down right yeah, we would assume that it would be a bit easier going down, although stairs in general are tough. Are you, do you use purslip breathing? Uh, yes. Okay. If you already coordinate it with walking up and down the stairs, that's awesome. If you don't already, it's something that you can do. What I mean by that is I've mentioned purslip breathing and what it is. It's not something that comes automatic to us. And so when you, if you've just learned about it today and you're going to start using it, it is something you have to think about. It is a great idea to incorporate it with any activity if you find that that activity causes shortness of breath. So when you're going down one step, take a breath in. As you're going down the next two steps, breathe out. It's that one to two ratio I explained. Even if it means you go down the stairs, quite slowly while you're trying to incorporate both things, the purslip breathing and walking, you'll feel better by the time you get down to the bottom of the stairs, possibly. And certainly going up, you're doing work. You're using the big muscles in your legs 
and it's hard work. So when you're going upstairs, one step up, a breath in. The next two stairs, a breath out. The other thing people sometimes struggle with is they want to go fast, as fast as they did when they were 30 years old. Why do I have to change and slow down? It may mean that in order to incorporate the purslip breathing and to not be as short of breath and exhausted at the end and need to recover, that you do need to slow down a little. That's really hard for some people. It's extremely hard for me. And yeah. sorry, but I, I tried to get the tendency. When I was at West Park uh, Rehab, they made a test on me and they said to me, walk. And I started walking, but by the time I was faster and faster and faster. So they told me <laughs> slow down. Yeah. Okay? Because that's the tendency I have all the time. Even yeah. my PSW tell me, okay, you're going too fast, too fast, too fast. So no. Yeah. It's still for me, cost me, I got two years in this, and cost me to realize that still I am sick. Yeah. And you know, it's really, it speaks to the quality of your life. So you can continue to go at the speed you were. Some people don't want to change. Nope, not going to do that. And then think about how tired you might be at the end of the day, because after you've completed each task, you've had to stop and rest for five minutes. It's just zapped your energy. Then if you were to try a few days of taking things a little slower, maybe by the end of the night, you're going to be awake enough to watch a movie or to do an extra task or two. So thinking about your energy levels and kind of pacing out your day. Um, and I think part of your question was when you bend over to tie your shoes, you get short of breath. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Probably because you're holding your breath. So another good idea uh -huh. when we talk about purse lip breathing, before you get ready to bend down, take a breath in. As you bend over to tie your shoes, breathe out with the purse lip breathing so that awesome. you're always moving air. All right. Thank okay. you. Welcome. I will try now. Okay. As soon as I finish, I will try. Perfect. Actually, that last point, Jody, is phenomenal because I bend over to tie my shoes and I got a big old belly now that I am short of breath, so I'm going to actually try it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to call it. That is our time, Jody. I appreciate your time. Thank that you. you.